Welcome back to the channel guys. Today we've got the most powerful small gaming laptop in the world, the Razer Blade 14. Keep it locked here as we dive into the performance and gaming benchmarks, fan noise tests, design and build quality, review of the internals, heat tests, some cool tips and tricks, and near the end our overall take on this machine as we list out the top pros and cons that you need to be aware of before forking over all that cash on a very expensive but really nice machine. I've also read through over a thousand questions on other Razer Blade 14 review videos in order to make sure that all unanswered questions are addressed. The model we got is the AMD Ryzen 9 5900 HX processor, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a one terabyte SSD drive. This is the brand new PCIe Gen 4 version, which is twice as fast as last gen. We also got the amazing NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3070 graphics card with eight gigabytes of GDDR6 dedicated video RAM. I don't really recommend the 3080 for this machine and I'll explain why a little later. Is this the most powerful small gaming laptop in the world? Like they say, it's also equipped with a QHD 1440p display with 165 hertz refresh rate. The overall design of the Razer Blade 14 is pretty sleek. It does feel a tad smaller than what I'm usually comfortable with, but given a week of settling in, it definitely grew on me. You can see that coming from an Alienware M17, that that can be quite the adjustment for me. The chassis and the screen are made of CNC milled aluminum with a smooth anodized matte black finish. While it looks great, it certainly is not immune to getting cluttered with fingerprints. The massive bold Razer logo just looks beautiful and really pops against that matte black lid. Now, despite the overall size and thinness, this laptop actually has the least amount of screen flex out of all the gaming laptops that I've tested. Screen wobble was also pretty minimal compared to the others. This was due to an overall tight and sturdy hinge that was somehow still smooth when opening and closing. It was a very interesting design choice to not include any vents on the sides. It relies completely on these two air intakes on the bottom and then some exhaust out the back. I found it very strange that they put a rear vent directly directly against the screen hinge. And we're gonna show you how that affected thermals here in a bit. You can see at the bottom, they made these long rubber nubs extra thick in an attempt to provide additional airflow underneath. And then you can see at the bottom of the screen, they made this bezel extra thick, probably in an attempt to provide extra protection to the screen due to the extra heat from those rear vents. I've seen a lot of comments wishing this was a 1610 screen instead of a 169 ratio. But honestly, for me personally, I want a screen with the least amount of letterboxing and also built for industry standards. Let me know in the comments why you prefer 1610. The sides have pretty average bezels with the top being a little thicker to make room for the webcam, which we'll show off a little later. The perky RGB lighting looked fantastic. It was also really bright with 16 levels of brightness that you could also control with the keyboard. We're also gonna show you some cool features and animations that this keyboard has that I have not seen on any gaming laptop. They took a page out of the MacBook Pro design with these speakers right here directly next to the keyboard and they look pretty large next to everything else. But as we're gonna show you later, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna have this THX spatial audio quality sound that it talks about. Overall design wise, I'd call it the BlackBook Pro because that's exactly what it feels like. And personally, I'm liking the style. For the ports, on the right side, we've got a Kensington lock port, an HDMI 2.1 port that's capable of 4K at 120 Hertz, a USB 3.2 Gen 2 type A port, and a USB-C port with power delivery and display port 1.4, which can also achieve 4K at 120 Hertz or 8K at 60 hertz and even power the laptop. Then on the left side, we've got your power port, another USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A port, and a second USB Type-C port, and then a headphone and microphone jack. Moving on to the internals. So taking a look at the inside, you can see we've got two 88 blade fans next to a large vapor chamber. Underneath this panel, we also have our soldered 16 gigabytes of RAM. It is pretty disappointing that 16 gigabytes is the max that it can come with, and it's downright irritating that they don't let you upgrade it. However, I do understand that it's actually enough for a lot of people. When I'm doing gaming tests, I usually don't see the games go above 14 gigabytes of RAM usage to get the job done. And this right here is our upgradable PCIe 4 SSD drive. This is actually pretty Pretty impressive as it's capable of almost two times the read write speeds of last gen. And over here is our Wi Fi 6E card, and beneath that, our teeny tiny little 61 watt hour battery. Yes, that is a very small battery, and yet they somehow claim that it can get up to 12 hours of battery life. Well, we put it to some actual real world tests. With 50% brightness and battery saver mode, we got two hours and 45 minutes with HD streaming, and with web surfing, we got three hours of battery life. 
and it took an hour and 15 minutes to recharge. So yes, it's true. Those complaints about the battery being less than adequate are legit, unfortunately. Now let's talk about the display quality. This display looks fantastic. It has the widest color space of 100% DCI-P3, so colors look rich, amazing, and incredibly accurate. It's also an IPS grade monitor, so you can be confident that you're getting the best possible viewing angles. While the display looks great, I'd have to admit that 1440p, at least for me, it's really not not that indistinguishable from 1080p at a screen this size. The pixels are already incredibly tiny at 1080p. The brightness maxes out at a little over 300 nits, which is honestly all the brightness you're going to need unless you're pretty frequently in direct sunlight. Thermals. So a Ryzen 9 with a 3070 GPU in a 14 inch laptop, how well do you think that got rid of the heat? Here are the CPU and GPU temperatures of each game, maxing them out at their highest preset settings. As far as the GPU goes, I was pretty impressed with how well it got rid of heat. The CPU is a different story. There was several games and several benchmarks where I maxed out at 100 degrees and then I started getting some throttling, but that's when the computer was pushing hard. It still performed pretty well in that heat despite its incredibly small size and very minimal ventilation. However, this was the coolest exterior that I felt on any gaming laptop. The actual surface and the touchpad and the palm rests felt incredibly cool compared to my other gaming laptops. A lot of people were complaining about the fan noise. When the computer was idle, you really didn't hear the fans that much. But when the computer was doing something, or when I cranked those fans all the way to 5300, it did get a little loud. Now for everyone's favorite part, performance and gaming benchmarks. For Geekbench 5, we got a single core score of 1437 and a multi-core score of 7381. For Cinebench R23, we got a multi-core score of 11682 and a single core score of 1423. For 3D Mark, we got an overall score of 8957 and a graphics score of 8976 and a CPU score of 8854. And here's a few bonus Pugent benchmark tests for all you creatives out there. For Adobe Premiere, we got a score of 562. For Photoshop, we got a score of 778, and for DaVinci Resolve, we got a score of 890. Those are pretty decent numbers, but how well did it do in games? Here are the frames per second we got at 1080p with each game, maxing them out at their highest preset settings. Not too shabby for a 14-inch laptop. Here's how those games performed at 4K, also maxing them out with their highest preset settings. As you can see, a few games performed pretty poorly, so if these are your favorite games, you're probably not going to have the best possible experience that you want to have, but then again, it is only a 1440p screen. You're never actually going to see 4K unless you go to a 4K screen, so keep that in mind. So for the sound quality, the sharp noises sounded pretty crisp, and you honestly really did feel pretty immersed within the spatial sound. But when you took the volume to its max, and any other noises that sounded a little bit heavier or a little bit bassier, those frequencies did not sound that great. I actually got quite a bit of distortion on some of the music I was playing. The quality of the webcam I'd say was just about average. Here's an indoor sample of that audio and video quality. And here's an outdoor test with a little bit more light. One cool feature about it though is that it's compatible with Windows Hello, which means that you can unlock the computer with your face. And 99% of the time, it works every time. Software. Okay, this is up there with my excitement that I had for the ASUS software. In the dashboard, you can see we've got Chroma Connect, and what that is, is the ability to connect to your different games. You can see Fortnite and Apex and Black Ops just automatically did that, which was pretty awesome. I noticed this when I first tested Black Ops, and it really did add that extra level of immersion in the game. So if we go back, you can see the Chroma Studio. In here, you can set your different lighting animations for your keyboard. Right now, I have it being controlled by the Chroma Visualizer, and what that does is it's actually using my audio right now to control the visual spectrum on the keyboard. We've got ambient awareness and what this does is it takes the color of whatever your screen is currently doing. And then fire is pretty cool. This is what that looks like. And then ripple basically anywhere that you touch on the screen it ripples from there and you can layer these on top of each other which is pretty nice. So layering your animations is something that I have not seen on a gaming laptop yet. And then wave is kind of more like a rainbow animation. And then as far as performance goes you go to system and then performance. In here you can change, you can manually adjust your fan settings and then over here in custom you can force boost your CPU to use all of the power it can use and then force boost your GPU as well over here you can switch between 60 Hertz or 165 Hertz depending on if you want to save on battery and then on this tab over here you can adjust your macros so my overall top reasons you might want to pass on this machine number one is the battery it's definitely the worst that I've seen on a gaming laptop but that's kind of expected on a 61 watt-hour battery number two is that soldered RAM I don't know why but 
it just irks me when companies take away your right to upgrade. 16 gigabytes max is sure to turn away some customers. And number three, I'd have to go with that sound. I know they brag about it, I know they say it's awesome, but the weird echoing with the speaking and the distortion I got when playing certain frequencies, I just didn't like it. You're gonna have to keep your volume at about 90%. My favorite reasons that you should buy this machine. Number one is portability. This is the lightest and easiest to carry gaming laptop that you can buy right now. And number two is the power. Yes, there are faster gaming laptops out there, but none that are this powerful at this size. And honestly, overheating is to be expected when you shove a Ryzen 9 HX processor in a 14 inch laptop. And my number three favorite thing about this machine that's just a little bit better than the rest are those lighting effects. There was just so much unexpected joy that I got when I first played those games that had those default lighting effects synced with the laptop already. It just added that much more of an immersion to your gaming experience. Aside from a few dislikes, this is an incredible laptop. It's on the pricey side, but to cram that much power in such a small machine, that's not something you see accomplished very often. So why do I recommend the 3070 and not the 3080? Well, for one, the 3080 is $600 more. And from a lot of the research I've been doing, the 3080 barely gives you 10% faster speeds. So $600 for barely that much of an improvement. Most of you guys are on a budget and I understand that. If you need something mobile that's incredibly fast, doesn't feel hot to the touch, it does get in internally hot, this is a great choice. I can't imagine how hot this would have got if it was an Intel processor instead of an AMD. And by the way, this is Razer's only AMD model in its entire lineup. And I know there's a lot of AMD fans out there. If you took a powerful gaming laptop and a MacBook Pro and they made a baby, that would be this laptop. Guys, if this review helped you and you plan to purchase a laptop in the near future, if you could please remember to use my affiliate links in the description below. You don't have to, but it doesn't cost you any extra to use them and it helps me out a lot. So I would really appreciate it. It. Guys, remember every week I do a giveaway that randomly selects someone who's interacted with this channel. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe with notifications turned on and keep an eye out for that each week. And the winner for this week is... Portkey. Thanks for watching, guys. I love you guys. God bless.